you would with me, uh, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 this morning. And uh, we, I think after five weeks, we're actually going to finish 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So we can give God the praise for that. Um, so, all that being said, and uh, take a deep breath. I mean, it's an uh, unusual uh, start to our worship service, and our prayers are, uh, I, th- I think, deep within us now. But let's just uh, kind of take a deep breath and go into God's Word together. Let's just see what God has for us this morning. I, I'm convinced of this. Uh, Satan doesn't want us to get much this morning. I believe that. And, uh, and to be honest with you all, I don't care. So let's just uh, let's, let's, uh, let's tell Satan to get gone and uh, let's see what God can do. Y'all with me on that? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So just, uh, just to kind of think about this a little bit, uh, we've gotten to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and it's very evident to us in looking at the Corinthian church. Uh, this is our 16th week in walking through 1 Corinthians. It's very evident that the church in Corinth was dealing with a pride problem. That, that's, that's, that was the issue. They were dealing with pride. The main issue that we've seen so far in these first, uh, in these first few months as we've walked through this is that they were doing something that was kind of weird um, they were ranking their pastors. They were like, you know, I, it, it would be, uh, it'd be like, it'd be like, no, I really like Murph the most. And then some of you say, no, but, but Swindle, I like old Swindle over there. He's a, he's a awesome, he's an awesome dude. And then I'd be saying, no, nah, you, you know, just give Swindle, you know, hang around Swindle a little while and then, then, then see how you're, how you are. And then the others saying, you know, Murph, 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 you know, he's a, he's a rough dude around the edges and, and, and that kind of stuff. And so they're, they're comparing pastors. Who was the best pastor? Was it Apollos? Was it Peter? Was it Cephas, who's, who's, uh, or Cephas, who's Peter? Or was it Paul? Um, and so the issue became a distraction. It showed that there was a lack of spiritual maturity in the Corinthian church. And honestly, when you really step back from it and take a look at it, it was a pretty good picture of today's church in many ways. Um, it's a, it's a pretty good picture about what can happen when a church is not focused on the gospel. It shows what a church looks like when a church is misguided, when it's off track from what it's supposed to be about. These, um, they, they, were, they were unpurposed comparisons. It didn't have anything to do with what really mattered, and that was the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. And it still happens today. It happens today so very often. Go here with me for just a minute. I mean, we hear things like this, and maybe, maybe there's no ill intention meant with these things, but often the conversations around churches, rather than do, do they meet with Jesus there, is it about Christ? Often the conversations become, how big is your church? How, how fast is your church growing? What summer camp do your students go to? Um... What kind of trips do your, does your youth group take? How much money does your church bring in? What, what side of town are y'all located on? Again, these pastors, who's your pastor? Is he, that, is he that guy that speaks well and, and entertains? Or this or that? I mean, it, be, it, becomes, it becomes more of a social agenda. What y'all average on Sundays? rather than, is Christ there? And honestly, like I said, I think many of these things are are well-intentioned, but they become distractions in the church. And let me just go here, and I'm just going to step out there and say it. I think it's offensive to God. Paul's goal with the Corinthian church was to to correct them from some errors, and we're going to see that there were many more errors in the upcoming weeks. As as we continue to walk through this, when we get to chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7, I mean, the floodgates are going to open. They were dealing with rampant sin within the body of Christ, within the church. And it's this reminder, listen to me real close, that sin breeds sin, doesn't it? Sin sin always breeds more sin if we don't put a stop to it, if there's no conviction. Here's Here's what was happening. There was a group in the Corinthian church, there was a faction of people who were more concerned about who the best pastor was and had gotten into this game of comparison had gotten unfocused on the gospel. They were focused on other things. They were more concerned with that than they were with, with Christ. And, and, and because of that first sin, we're going to see later on that uh, 
the church became sin sick. There was, there was sexual sin. There was gossip. There was dishonesty, dishonesty within the body of Christ. And it festered in the Corinthian church. And Paul, but Paul began with this sin of comparison. And, and then other sin resulted. You don't, here, here's the problem in our lives. When you don't deal with your first sin all of a sudden, y'all been here? I've been, I've been there. You turn around, there's a second sin. And there's a third sin. And then all of a sudden you get to a place and you say, I never really even intended to get here. And oh Lord, how did I get to this place? Like there was a time I wanted to walk with you and I wanted to be strong in my faith. But how did I get here? And it all started with them, just with this simple thing of, I like that, patter, that pastor better than the, than the other one. And if you step back through chapter 4, you begin to see it. Let's just, real quick, let's do that. Let's, let's bring ourselves back up to speed. Look at, look at chapter 4, verse 1 on the screen. Here's what Paul said. And he had been dealing with them on this pastor comparison. He said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't be viewing us like this, like who's the best pastor. He said, this is how one should regard us. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Y'all remember that from several weeks back? Paul said, you should view us as stewards and servants. We shouldn't, these pastors shouldn't be held up as rock stars or, more, or important celebrities in the community, but as servants and stewards of the gospel. Paul, we, we said this several weeks back, Paul used this word, huertes, which means servant or underling. Paul had in mind of one who rowed in the belly uh, of a ship, an under rower. I think we got a picture of it. Look, look at this. Look at this. Do we have that picture? An under rower. That's the best dudes I could find. But that's what it was. It, it, it was. It, they were the under rowers in the in the ship on the bottom level, and they would actually row and they would row and they would row to the beat of a drum, rowing and rowing. It was not a glamorous job. And Paul said, "This is how." He was, saying, he was talking about himself and Apollos and Peter, these other leaders. He's saying, this is how we should be viewed. And listen, if you're a Christian this morning too, this is how we should be. Hands on the oar, rowing the church, serving the church in the right direction, shouldn't we? That's what we as believers ought to, ought to be, hypuertes. It's one of the more unusual words that we see in the Greek language. This word for servant is it's the under rower. The, the, the rower on board of a warship, later it came to refer to someone who, who uh, performed manual hard labor. And th there were a lot of aspects of the under rower's job. He had to row to the captain's beat. They had to row together. They had to trust the captain. By the way, the captain of the church is not the pastor it's not the youth pastor. It's not the elder. The, the, the captain of the church is Jesus and the gospel of Christ. And so they had to trust the captain. They were, they were, get this, they were committed for life. Christianity is not just pray a prayer and I've, I've got my salvation and now I just go on and live how I want. They received no honor for it. The honor came from what they had and who they were. The honor for us as believers is not that we get credit for what we do, but that we are credited eternity by Jesus Christ, and we have been given life through Christ that we don't deserve. Servants and stewards of the gospel. The gospel, the one thing that changes lives. We get to verse 2. Look at verse 2 on the screen. It says, Moreover, Paul said it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. So he says we should be stewards. You should be used as stewards and servants, and it should be people that are found faithful. You're, not only are we, are we supposed to be servants and stewards, but we're called to be faithful stewards of the gospel, faithful servants to, to others sharing the gospel. That word faithfulness or faithful there means trustworthiness. It's like someone who's been, in, been put in charge of the master's possession. The Holman Bible Dictionary describes stewardship as uh, a steward and, and one that is trustworthy and faithful, is one who's utilizing and managing all the resources that God provides for the glory of God and for the betterment of his creation. That's, that's what we're supposed to be about as Christians. Look at verses 3 and 4. Paul goes on, he said, But with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. And verse 4 says, For... I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. And verses 3 and 4, when we talked about this a couple of weeks back, it's a, it's a huge lesson for us. We need to, 
We need to heed what it's saying. We need to listen to it. Here's the problem, and I'll just put this as simple as I can, and let's take this to heart. Too many folks, and I'm talking to myself too, too many folks are more concerned with what people think and concerned too little with what God thinks. The, the steward, the servant, the faithful one is only worried about what the master things. And I'm here to tell you this morning, when it's all said and done, when we as believers, and we talked about this, when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, when we as believers, when it's all said and done, and we give an account of our lives from the time we became Christians until the time we go to be with the Lord, it's not going to matter one iota what someone else thinks about you. It's going to matter what God knows about you. And, and we better start thinking along those lines of what does God think, not what do people think. And I believe that what Paul is saying in these verses will change our lives. It makes you discover your identity. Who am I? What are my motives? What is my heart? It tells us right here. Our identity, our identity, honestly, our identity always gets us to do things that we otherwise would not do. And what I mean by that is when, when we care more about popularity or perception or what people think, then we'll perform for the world, won't we? And it will always lead us into sin. But when our identity is in Christ, when we're faithful servants and stewards, when that's what we're seeking to be, when our identity matches what we say we are, when our walk begins to match our talk, then our abilities and what we can conjure up on our own and what we think people want to do for us don't really matter so much anymore because we realize that we have the power of Christ in us. You know, it's interesting to me that Paul's the one that, that was writing this because Paul understood this. If you, if you historically study Paul, Paul was not the greatest orator of the gospel. He was not the greatest speaker. He didn't have the... If you read about Apollos, Apollos was a great speaker. Paul didn't have the fluidity of Apollos. He didn't have the fire of Cephas or Peter. You've read about Peter. I mean, that guy, he could, he could light it up in a room sometimes. And, and Paul wasn't... Paul wasn't like that. Paul, Paul admitted it. Um, Paul was, if you looked at Paul, you would think, that guy's a pastor, that guy's a church planter. And Paul was very aware that, that different people have different gifts. And what mattered to Jesus was how we use those gifts and who we use them for. And Paul believed, at this point in his life, Paul believed, and he wasn't always that way, but Paul believed now and do you believe it this morning that Christ is sufficient? It, it, remi it reminded me of Moses, if you think about Moses in the Old Testament. When God chose Moses to lead the people, do you remember what Moses' response was when God said, I I'm choosing you to lead my people? Moses said, M Me? M me l lead the people? But... But I am slow of, of speech. But God said, yes, Moses, but I am behind you. And I'm before you. And I'm calling you to do this. Paul understood that we should care about what God thinks, not what people think. Boy, if we could do that. Paul could, have, Paul could have bragged on some of the things that he accomplished. He could, have, he could have said to these people, he could have said to the people around him, Hey, I'm Paul. Did, did the resurrected Jesus appear to you? Paul could have said, Hey, how many churches have you, how many churches have you planted? Pa Paul could have said, how, how many times have you been persecuted? He didn't tell them to do that. He just tells them, Hey, your comparison of pastors and the way you view church, it needs to stop. Stop your prideful actions and get focused on what really matters for eternity, on Christ. Read verse 5 with me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. He says, stop your pride. Judgment's going to come. Judgment seat of Christ. 
Great white throne judgment for those that don't believe. Listen, do you know as believers there will come a time we'll stand before God and this is the reality? There will be, there will be rewards as we stand before Christ at the judgment seat for how we lived our lives and the motives we had and the genuineness that we had behind it. But there'll also be regret at the judgment seat of Christ. The times that we gave up on the purposes of God when we knew in our hearts that we shouldn't have. The times when we didn't take opportunities that we should have. We'll be, we'll be ashamed of the times that we decided to step into sin rather than walk in the ways of Christ. We will be held accountable. And sometimes I think we just don't think that's going to be the reality. We don't, we don't, we don't see the plank in our own eyes sometimes. I heard a pastor tell the story of a lady who was hanging her clothes out to dry. And her neighbor, the, the lady that lived next door to her, kept looking out the window when she would hang her clothes out. And she became judgmental because as the lady would hang her clothes out, her neighbor would, would say, why is she hanging those clothes out to dry? They're still dirty. Does she not know how to wash clothes? It would happen again and again, and she started complaining to her husband. They would look out the window. She'd say to her husband, obviously this lady does not know how to wash her clothes. It, it happened a second and a third and a fourth time. And all of a sudden one morning, she looked out and the, lady, the, the lady's clothes were clean. And, and, she, and she told her husband, well, I guess somebody finally taught her how to, how to wash her clothes. And her husband said, no, I woke up early this morning and I cleaned our window. You know, listen, the, the, the reality is, <laughs> y'all get that, like halfway home, y'all get that. Listen, the reality is we all have dirty windows. It's this reminder that we need to take the log out of our own eye. That we need to remember that sin breeds sin when we choose to sin and then we don't deal with it. Usually we can turn around a little bit later and we've walked in more sin. So that brings us back up to last week. We're just now getting there. Look at verse 6. This is where we were last week. Y'all remember this last week? Look at verse 6. I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers that you may learn by us not to go beyond what's written. Don't, don't add to God's word. Don't take away. Don't go beyond what's written. And here was the pride problem. This was the religious pride, the spiritual pride that we talked about last week, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Paul was saying, it's got to stop. Quit being prideful. And, and here's the reality, church. We live in a prideful world. We're, we're not going to learn from our world how to do the things of God. We live in a prideful world. We live in a world where everybody thinks they deserve everything, right? And I'm here to tell you this morning that we are sinners. We are wretchedly separated from God because of our own sin. We don't deserve one thing. Not one. But we live in that kind of world. Our world is saying, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. People, people want to be paid for not working. People want to be given what is not theirs. Competition is made out to be a cruel tactic. We want a participation trophy in everything. But Paul knew that we don't deserve one thing. And what we have received from God is by His grace and we should be thankful. Paul knew that the day was coming when recognition would come from God. He knew that nothing needed to be added or, added or taken away from what Christ did. That's why he says, don't go beyond what is written. He, in, in, in modern day terms, he's saying, he's saying keep it biblical. We, we don't need a bunch of, listen, we don't need a bunch of hogwash coming from our churches. What we need is the gospel of Jesus Christ and what is biblical. All right, let's start today's sermon. Look at verses 7 through 21. Let's just walk through this. We'll see what God does with it. I'm not going to keep you forever, but let's, let's give it some time. Let's look at it. Verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? All right? Let's just kind of walk through each. Verse 7, it poses some questions, I think, that really make us think. I think, I think I would say this. God doesn't randomly play favorites. Okay, if you're taking notes, God does not randomly play favorites. You're, you're not more special than the person sitting next to you, and that person's not more special than you. And, and I think Paul's saying that if, if, if you have Christ, then why are you acting like 
he's not sufficient. Why are you acting superficial? Why do you keep acting like you need something more? Why do you have to focus on comparing the pastors when you have Christ? Isn't that sufficient enough? Now, look at verses 8 through 13. And I want you to notice as we read this, I'm going to go ahead and give you the point on this. I want you to notice as we read 8 through 13 that Paul, and I can kind of relate with this, I kind of like this, Paul uses sarcasm to make a point. You think, is that biblical? Well, Paul uses it here. Paul gets sarcastic, to, I think, to make a point with these guys. Look at verses 8 through 13. Oh, already you have all you want? Already you've become rich? Without us, you have become kings and would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We're fools for Christ's sake. Oh, but you're wise in Christ. That's what he's saying to them. We're weak. Oh, but you're strong. You're held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, he gets honest with them, with them. We hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed. We're buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. So Paul uses sarcasm. He begins to get forceful and he gets sarcastic. Now, I'm not promoting sarcasm necessarily, but so don't go home and say, Pastor Murph did a lesson and told all of us to be sarcastic. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. But sometimes sarcasm makes you realize how ridiculous something is, doesn't it? Stephen Wright said, Light travels faster than sound. That's why some people appear bright until they speak. Oscar Wilde says, I'm not young enough to know everything. Another writer, I don't know who it was, says, it's okay if you don't like me. Not everyone has good taste, right? Sarcasm. Oscar Wilde said, some cause happiness wherever they go, others whenever they go. And Abba Eden said, history teaches us that men and nations behave wisely once they've exhausted all other alternatives, right? If I had a dollar for every smart thing you say, I'd be poor, right? I don't believe in plastic surgery, but in your case, go ahead. And the sign that was in Albert Einstein's office read, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So Paul uses sarcasm to get them to see how ridiculous that what they were doing was. In verse 9, he says, the, the reality is, these, is, is all of us pastors, you're, you're comparing. Um, we're not demigods. We're not supposed to be fame seekers. We're supposed to be apostles and servants for the faith of Jesus Christ, but you're making us a spectacle to the world. And that Greek word for spectacle in verse 9 is the word theatros, where we get our word theatrics. In real life, theatrics was very common in this culture. In other words, what I mean by that is that they would make a spectacle out of real things that happened in life. Prisoners would be drugged behind horses and taken to the theater, to the stadium, where they would be eaten by lions or killed or made sport of. It was a public event or spectacle. Verse 12, as you read it, it almost, as he begins to say, we labor, we work with our own hands, when reviled, we bless, when persecuted, we endure. It begins to sound like the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave. And Paul saying in verse 13, you're regarding us as some kind of rock stars, but, but look at how the world views us. The world views us as scum, he says. And that's pretty true in our world. These, these Corinthians didn't want that. They wanted the approval of the world. But listen, we're going to be waiting a long, long, long time as Christians if we're waiting to get the approval of our world, the approval of our culture. The world's never going to approve of God's word. But I promise you this, what the world values, God will reverse one day. It'll come to a screeching halt. Listen, and, and I think that sometimes we just don't realize it. In the culture in which we live, most of the world lives on less than $2 a day. We, we haven't made it. In the USA, we, we, um, 
I think we've been we've we've been in a culture that wants affirmation too much. We're we're living in a culture now that because it's becoming more and more Christless, that it's having an identity crisis. Verses fourteen through eighteen. Let's just jump on in. I won't prolong it. Verses fourteen through eighteen. Paul said, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. So his motive was not to shame them. He wanted them to see what was the truth. For for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. We'll talk about that in a second. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. Paul gets honest with them. The point here is Paul gets honest with them about their motives. He gets honest with them about who they are following. And he pleads with them, get this, he pleads with them to let him be their example. Now, on the surface, that may kind of sound self-centered. Paul's saying, let me be your example. Um, you gotta, you got to really be stepping out there to say that. You're putting, yourself, you're putting yourself on the line when you say, hey, look at me, let me be your example. Sounds a little cocky, sounds a little self-centered. Watch me, listen to me, let me be your example. Why could Paul say that? Why could he say that? No, I'll tell you this, not because he was perfect. All you've got to do is read Romans chapter 7, and you see Paul admitting that he was far from perfect, and he still sinned, and he still messed up. But I will say this, Paul had spent much of his life before this being arrogant, being prideful, and being Christless. But now he was saved, he was humble, he, he was a servant, he was sold out to Christ, he was planting churches, he was about the business of Christ, and he made no bones about it. And he makes it clear in verse 18 that, that, that not every believer, get this, and I think this is important, not every believer in Corinth had become arrogant. I mean, it, it wasn't the whole congregation. It's, it's important it's important for us to realize that just because some in a congregation abandon Christ, it doesn't mean the entire congregation has. Jesus repeatedly made that point in Revelation as he talked about the churches in Revelation. There were several of them. Like the church in Sardis in Revelation 3, 4, he said, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled your clothes. Watch them. Let them be the example. They walk with me. They're dressed in white. They're worthy. And I think the same principle holds true for us today. Some Christians, and here's the point I'm trying to make, and we need to learn this in the body of Christ. Some Christians may walk off into sin, but it doesn't need, mean that we need to go with them. It, it doesn't mean that just because another believer is, is, is walking in some sin that we say, oh, okay, it's okay, let's do that too. Let's forget what God says. Because the reality is a Christian can make a bad choice, but it doesn't make it Okay. Maybe another Christian is cliquish and they believe they're better than everyone and won't speak to certain people. We don't have to imitate that behavior. That's not of Christ. Maybe there's others in the congregation that refuse to share their faith and, and, and don't live out an example. That's not of Christ. We don't have to do that too. We don't have to imitate the behavior. Remember, sin breeds more sin. Over in chapter 5, verse 6, we haven't got there, but Paul's going to say, don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? We don't need to let those that are not walking with Christ, in other words, those that walk with Christ need to be setting the culture in the church. I mean, think about it. How many congregations have been carried away by two or three individuals that have an agenda other than Christ? Let's be careful to do what's right regardless of what people do. Let's do what Christ says to do. Because some in their congregation have become arrogant. They were... They were, not, um, they were not focused on Christ. They, were, they had influence in the church, and, and Paul was trying to put a stop to people following after that. It's this reality, like Proverbs 11.2 says, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Let's look at verses 19 and 20. We're getting close. Verses 19 and 20, But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I'll find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. He said, I want to really, really see what's going on with these people. And then verse 20 says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk. This is key right here. The kingdom of God does not consist in talk, 
but in power. I put two notes on your on your note sheet there on the on the newsletter. Or two two blanks there at the end for verses nineteen and twenty. We need power, not talk. The church needs power, not talk. We need God sent power. There's no power in just talking the talk. You can't talk the talk. You can talk the talk. Here's the deal. You can talk the talk and people can see right through it. And God already knows it. The church needs to be living with the power of Christ. And Paul's coming to Corinth, verse 20 says. He's, his intention is to come to Corinth to deal with that and to help them see that there's power in Christ. The, the, the Corinthians have been doing a lot of talking about how great they were and how great these pastors were and all this stuff. And we can do a lot of talking too. But the last time I checked, talk is cheap. Actions are what matters. The action needs to back up the talk, right? It's so easy to talk in the church. It's so easy to talk about what we need to do. It's, a, it's another thing altogether to actually do it. It's easy to talk about what needs to be changed in the church. It's another thing altogether to look at ourselves and what needs to be changed inside our hearts that will cause those changes. It's so easy to talk about coming to Jesus and, and, and having a relationship with Jesus. It's easy to talk about that, but it's another to actually do it, to repent of sin and to serve Him and to live out the fruits of the Spirit that prove that we really know Christ. The gospel, God's reign, is not about cheap talk. It's about power. And what kind of power is Paul talking about? Until you get to verse 19, the term power is not used at all in this book to speak of human power. It always denotes God's power. And we see that in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. We see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, when he said that you're, you being saved is by the power of God. You don't save yourself. He, he's saying that those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, in chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, it came by... The, by Christ, by the power of God, and by the wisdom of God. I couldn't help, but as I read this passage over and over this week, God just says, you got to ask Him. you got to ask Him. Do you know the power of the cross of Jesus Christ this morning? Has your life been impacted by the power of Christ? Paul is, Paul is dealing with this. The last verse... This morning, verse 21, Paul's coming to deal with, with preference here. Notice this in verse 21. He says, what do you wish? What's your preference? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? Paul asked the Corinthians how they would prefer he approached them in their problems. Harshly or gently? Should I, should I come harshly or should I come gently? Do I need to come with a whip, or do I need to come in love with a gentle spirit? The Corinthians had a choice to make. Would, would, would Paul have to take him out to the woodshed, or, would, or could he come and deal gently with them? And here's what I thought over and over this week. And then it got a little bit deeper. I thought, well, because I'm, I'm thinking on Paul writing this. What if Paul were to come to us? What if Paul were to, were to walk in? I mean, he, could, he wouldn't do that. It's been nearly too... It's been two millennia since then. I mean, what if Paul were to come in and he were to say, how would he come to us? How would he look at today's church? And then I thought, that's not really the question they need to be asking. How would Jesus find us? Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that one day Jesus Christ will come to judge the lost. The Lord Jesus, the scripture says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and judging the lost, those that don't know Christ. If you don't know Christ this morning, this would be you. The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who did not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. That's the reality of someone who's lost and doesn't know Christ. He'll also come, like we said, to judge his people. The judgment seat of Christ. Totally different judgment. You want to be at that one. It'll be a time of, it'll be a time of regret. There will, there will be consequences there, but it's also a time of, of reward for his people. 
It's also the time Matthew 25, 34 says, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And that's where you want to be. So the question this morning is, how would Jesus find us? Paul's rebuking the church here. He's saying that your focus is wrong. You need to be about the gospel. And so the question becomes for, for us this morning, how would Jesus find us? Paul was saying, how, how am I going to find you when I come there? We're asking, when Jesus comes, how, how will he find us? Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, that, that it's truth. Lord, that we don't, have to, uh, we don't have to make up anything, add to it, take away to make it sound entertaining or to be something we want to listen to. Lord, it's your, it's your word. It is what it is. And, um, and Lord, it's what we need. It's life-changing. It, it changes hearts and lives forever. Lord, we know it doesn't go out void. Lord, even this morning as we've shared the gospel, we know that there's purpose behind it, God, and that you are moving and changing hearts and lives. Even for some that didn't walk in wanting to be changed or uh, a heart was hardened and not ready for worship, Lord, you're, you're going to find us at all different places this morning. Lord, take us where we are. Lord, th this room's full of believers this morning, Lord, that already know you. But maybe we've got some sin in our lives we're not dealing with. Maybe we're not taking our walk with you seriously. Maybe we're trying to balance between the world and between strong faith with you. Or maybe we, um, maybe the reality is, is that we're, we're playing a juggling act. Lord, we're, we're sitting on a fence, and that's just not what a b true believer can do or does. It just won't sustain. So, Lord, find us in a place of repentance, in a place where we, we long to walk closely with you. Lord, revive your church and work on your people. And God, this morning for the lost, if there's anybody here, anybody listening that doesn't know you, they've heard all this and they say, I hear that, but I don't even know if I know Jesus, that even today may be the day of salvation. Lord, they call upon you, ask you to forgive them of their sins, ask you to save them by the blood of Christ. Lord, they come to you through Jesus. Lord, thank you for your grace. Lord, um, again, as we've, as we've had a week of thanksgiving, Lord, we've got much to be thankful for, but most of all, find us thankful. Lord, for what you've done for us. Lord, as we dismiss, as we go, Lord, as we say in some way or another every week, Lord, don't let us just be the church in here, but let us be the church out there too, Lord, to make a difference and to live out our faith in the world you put us in on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Lord, we pray in Christ's name this morning, God's people say together, amen.